Linda, Linda Carlson uh, is our speaker tonight and she holds the Enbridge Chair of Research in uh, Psychosocial Oncology. Um, she's uh, an Alberta Innovates Health Solutions Health Scholar and uh, full professor of Psychosocial Oncology at the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. She's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Psychology and her research is uh, uh, much about mindful-based um, uh, cancer recovery, and that's what she's talking about tonight. Um, she's, uh, she's got two children. She lives in Canmore and uh, loves, to, uh, loves to hike and uh, bicycle. And, uh, and uh, anyway, we're very fortunate to have her here tonight. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Linda Carlson. Thank you. So thank you for coming out during Stampede in the middle of summer. Um, so I, and also thank you for inviting me, Kelly, and organizing everything. It's great to see such a good group out tonight. So I'm going to talk to you about mindfulness, this idea of mindfulness, and how we have applied that in the area of cancer treatment and recovery. So what is it, and how can it perhaps help me? So uh, before we do that, let's make sure we're all in the right place. So she says, yeah, we're here for the happiness through meditation seminar. Oh, no, I'm sorry, that was a typo. And the sign says happiness through medication. <laughs> so just so you know, this is the meditation seminar. I'm not going to be talking about any drugs here. Um, so what I am going to talk about is what is mindfulness. And I'm curious for people who are here, how many of you are familiar with that term or that idea already? Yes. One, two, three, four, four or five hands. So a few people who know about it, uh, most of you, it's fairly new to you. So I'll spend some time telling you really what it is, what's all the hype. Um, and I'll talk to you about mindfulness-based interventions. So these kind of training programs that have been developed to help people like yourselves that are totally new to it to learn how to be more mindful. Then I'll talk to you about our specific program we developed at the Tom Baker Cancer Center, which is called Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery. Um, and I probably won't get into too much other mindfulness research. I will talk a bit about uh, the research we've done on our program, but I'll try and limit that because not everybody loves graphs and numbers as much as I do. Okay, so what is mindfulness? So mindfulness has become a big thing in the media lately, and you can see meditation, the mindful revolution. These are two time covers, I think, 10 years apart. So there's a lot of myths and misconceptions, and just from looking at these magazine covers, you might think that if you become mindful, you become a blissful young blonde woman. Perhaps not. Mindfulness is for everybody. So the way we define it is paying attention on purpose in the present moment and applying an open and accepting attitude to that. Pretty simple, right? Just paying attention to your life as it's happening. So it's two things. It's a way of being in the world doesn't take any extra time to be mindful rather than mindless, which would be the opposite. So it's a way that you can move through your life, but it's also a practice. It's also a specific training and meditation that we set aside time every day to do. And the practice, the formal practice of the mindfulness meditation allows us to become more mindful in our daily life. So these pictures sort of illustrate those ideas. So who's more mindful here, the dog or the person? Who's winning? So the dog is seeing exactly what's there. Yes? Excuse me, it's just where you're standing. Oh, am I in the way? You know what? I can't. I don't have a remote mouse, so I don't have a choice. <laughs> I can, um, I don't know how else to do the slides. Would it be better if I sat down? Okay, I can do that. The battery on my remote clicker died at some point recently. Is that better? Okay. So the dog wins the contest about being more mindful because the person, their mind is full of all sorts of stuff that's not actually happening in the present moment, but the dog's actually there with the trees and the, the trees in the park. So the first one illustrates a way of being in the world, and the second picture illustrates the practice of mindfulness, which is the actual setting aside of time and sitting and doing meditation. So you don't have to sit on a rock overlooking the ocean at sunset time to do mindfulness meditation. So this idea of being in the present moment, as I said, is simple, but it's not easy because what are our minds doing instead, typically? It turns out when you monitor people, we have, each of us has between 50 and 70,000 different thoughts every single day. That's a lot of thoughts. 
And they've done studies where they give people um, monitors and they ping them every now and again and ask them what they're thinking about. And it turns out about half the time, our thoughts are not in the present moment. So your mind is wandering. Where's your mind going? It turns out we're happier when we're in the present moment. And again, why is that? Well, where's your mind going? So you might be like this guy, and your mind's racing off to the future, right? Instead of being in the present moment, you're thinking about all the things you have to do and all the worries, and what if this happens, and what if that happens, and how am I going to handle all of this? And you're stressed out, and you're anxious, right? Or you could be like this woman. She's in the past. Her mind's dwelling on the what ifs, and the if onlys, and the shoulda, coulda, woulda. She's feeling depressed and having regrets, maybe being angry about the way things turned out. Why me? Right? So your mind is there in the past. It's racing to the future. You miss the present moment. And those times when you're ruminating about the past and worrying about the future, of course you're not as happy. It turns out in the present moment, often, if we can really pay attention, things are generally OK. But the problem is that our minds have the tendency to not want to do that. So we have to retrain ourselves. And that's what mindfulness is about. It's about being in the now. Right? Rather than dwelling in the, the yesterday and the tomorrow, it's trying to actually live our lives in the now. You know, we often say, I mean, the past is gone, you can't change it. The future is just a fantasy, it hasn't happened yet. The only time we really get is the now. So we break down these components of mindfulness into three pieces. Um, we talk about intention, attention, and attitude. So the why of mindfulness is our intention. Why do we do it? Or how do we do it, I guess? Why? We do it on purpose, and sometimes our intention is as simple as I just want to wake up to my life. Your intention may also be more specific, like I want to cope with the symptoms related to my cancer treatment, or I just want to get through this difficult treatment, or I want to think about how I want to live my life, what brings me meaning and purpose. So that's why you do the practice. And what is it that we actually do? The core of the practice is training our ability to pay attention. So this skill, it's like, I often make a comparison to learning to play the piano or learning to play tennis, right? You don't learn how to play piano by reading books about it or talking to people about it. You're not gonna be a virtuoso without practicing. And the same is with training your mind. You're not gonna learn to think or focus and pay attention in a different way unless you practice it over and over and over again. And it turns out when you do that practice, the what of mindfulness, it actually changes the way your brain functions. It changes the way your brain is wired. Your neurons actually grow new pathways that support the ability to be in the present moment, to be mindful. So there's why we do it, what we do, and there's also how we do it. That's our attitudes. So you could approach this in a very critical way, like, oh, this is hard, I can't do it, this is terrible, I'm no good at this, I'm doing it wrong. Or you can be more open and accepting, like, wow, isn't that interesting? Look at my mind jumping all over the place. Wow, I just noticed that when I think about this, I have this reaction in my body. So there's curiosity, there's acceptance. You might be like, wow, I'm really anxious right now, I'm really worried, I'm scared of what the future holds, or I'm sad, and being accepting of wherever you find yourself. So it's not, you know, pushing away the difficult things and bringing yourself to a blissful state, it's about being aware of the reality of your life. So there's also, as I said, misconceptions about mindfulness, so I always talk about what mindfulness is not. So it's not just relaxation, although many people do find it relaxing. So it's not just that, lying in the hammock, having a good time. It's not this idea of hypnosis or mind control. It's not something someone does to you um, that changes your mental state in any way. And it's also not a religious practice, or it's not prayer. Um, it's adaptable to people from any religious background. So it comes from an Asian Buddhist tradition, but the way it's been brought to the West is that it's sort of secularized and people can adapt it into your own faith tradition. So if you have a prayer practice, you come from a certain religion or no religion at all, the mindfulness is really just this awareness and it can be adapted into whatever background or belief system you have. It's also not just clearing your mind of all thoughts, like those women on the Time magazines, right? They look so blissful. Um, that's not the idea with mindfulness. The idea is being aware of your experience in the moment, whatever it is. So it might be busy thoughts, it might be more calm and peaceful, um, but not always. 
So people have this idea that, oh, if my mind's racing, I'm doing it wrong, I'm no good at it, I can't do this mindfulness thing. And that's actually not true at all. As long as you're aware of your mind racing, you're doing it right. Um, so this is where I promote one of my books that I wrote called The Art and Science of Mindfulness. And this is actually more of a book for healthcare professionals and people who are going to be um, helping other people learn how to be mindful. So it's a clinician training manual. We talk about theories of mindfulness, how to be a mindful therapist, how to do mindfulness-based uh, types of therapies. So we like to use lots of poetry in our programs. Um, we think it really cuts to the heart of the matter sometimes. So many of you may know this poem. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. So that's Thoreau from Walden. And this really captures that idea of being in the moment and living your life fully, no matter how much time you have. So why mindfulness? Why do we think that's helpful? Um, and I'll talk more about the context of cancer. But it turns out the only certainty in life is change, right? And it's the fighting against this or the unwillingness to acknowledge and act upon the reality of change, trying to grasp onto things and make things be the way we want them or stay the way they were, that's the root cause of all suffering because we're denying the reality of nature. So mindfulness is a process by which we begin to see on a personal level, this constant change that's happening and we learn to sort of ride the wave, right? Go with the flow, accept the inevitability. So I talked about the attitudes and I'll just briefly mention the ones we try to emphasize in our program. And we use these attitudes when we're learning mindfulness meditation, but they're also very helpful throughout your life day to day. Um, so this idea of non-judging, and the first step there is to notice that we are always judging. You're probably judging right now. I like this talk. I don't like it. She's going too fast, too slow. It's boring, whatever, right? So we notice the fact that we're judging not only others, but we're judging ourselves and our experience and begin to ask the question, what is the consequence of this judging I'm always doing? Is it helpful or not? The second attitude is patience. So, you know, we're a fast food society, right? It's like, I want to relax and I want to relax now. You know, so we push things. We don't have the patience to take the time it takes to learn to think differently, be differently in the world. So slowing down a little bit. And I think maybe, you know, as you get to become seniors, like many of you are, I've I, I found that you tend to have practiced patience a lot more. And, and many of you are better at it than the younger generation. But it doesn't come naturally to many of us. And I talked about this idea of acceptance. And acceptance is different than kind of giving up right? Where it's more uh, seeing the reality of where you are, and you may not like where you are. Nobody wanted to get cancer, right? But if that's the situation, then that's where you are. You have to see clearly your starting point before you're ever able to make any decisions that might move you in a different direction. So this idea of accepting where we're at, letting go of having to control everything. You know, we're very controlling. A lot of us want to try and make things go the way we want them to go, but it's a losing battle because there's so many things we don't have control of. So can we let go of those things that we can't affect? And this idea of non-striving. So this is a paradox, actually, of this practice. So you may come into it with, I just want to learn how to relax, but that idea of the harder you try to relax, the less you're going to be able to. So the paradox is that the only way you're going to achieve the sorts of outcomes you may want is to let go of them and just focus on this idea of being in the moment, not doing anything, just being. You know, this concept of we become human doings, can we get back to being human beings? Trusting in yourself and your own basic wisdom, your own goodness, trusting the process. These are practices that have been around for two and a half thousand years, um, not for no good reason, right? And this idea of beginner's mind. So beginner's mind is about stepping back and letting go of our old sort of judgments and labels and maybe seeing ourselves for the first time and our abilities. And you know, maybe you have this idea, oh, I'm not the kind of person who does that flaky new agey meditation stuff. Well, really, is this attitude helping you? Maybe you need to step back and say, you know, can I approach this as if it's a fresh thing? Um, and like a child, you know how kids, they think everything's so exciting. I mean, that's why it's frustrating, right? Because it takes you half an hour to walk a block. But they have beginner's mind, and they appreciate the beauty of things that we just write off and take for granted. 
So often people say, well, I don't know about these attitudes, you know, it seems like a big difference, a big change, a, a lot to do in a short period of time. And I often say to people, well, you don't have to do these things, you could do the opposite. And that would make you a judgmental, impatient, rejecting, grasping, striving, suspicious, know-it-all. How does that sound? Right? So those are your options. And usually at that point someone says, that's me, I am already that, and it's really miserable. And we call that a recipe for stress, basically. So I'm going to give you one other poem and then we'll uh, take a break and do a little bit of a mindfulness exercise. So this one's called The Guest House. It says, this being human is a guest house, every morning a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still treat each guest honorably. They may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. And that's from Rumi. So this poem illustrates that idea of acceptance and openness to whatever your experience is and what it has to teach you. So now what I'd like to do is just a really simple paying attention mindfulness exercise. Um, and I'll stand up, but you guys don't have to right now. I'll get you to stand up and do some yoga a bit later. Um, but all we're going to do is pay attention to our breath. And we choose our breath because our breath is right there. It's always there. We don't have to think about it, remember to bring it with us, it's right there in our bodies, and we want to become more connected what, with what's happening in our bodies and our minds. So we're just going to pay attention to our breathing. We're not going to change it in any way, and one way to help you pay attention is to put one hand kind of here over your chest. You can probably feel some movement there, and put another hand here over your belly. Notice any judgmental thoughts about the size of your belly, and you can let those go. And if you're comfortable, let your eyes close. And as I said, I don't want you to change your breath. I just want you to pay attention to it. So it's like you're a breath detective. What can you notice? So you may notice movement in the top hand or the bottom hand or both. So just making mental notes to yourself. Where do you feel the movement? How much in each hand? And noticing how long the breaths are. So how long is the in-breath? How long is the out-breath? Are they equal length? Is one longer or shorter than the other? Is there a pause at either end of the breath, after the in or after the out? And notice if your mind wanders. It may have already. And if it has wandered, where did it go? Is it planning your future, analyzing, judging, thinking about the past, and then bring it back? Just note where it went and bring it back to rest on the breath. So as you're paying attention to your body, you may also notice things like tension. Sometimes there's tension in the face or neck or shoulders. And you'll notice yourself being distracted by the noises, and that's okay too. So you'll, you'll notice that, oh, my mind just went to that noise and I'm thinking, what is it? And so come back to your breath. So noticing any tension you may even be able to notice your heart beating or your stomach gurgling. Notice your energy level. Do you feel drowsy or alert? And sometimes when we just pay attention to our breathing, it changes on its own. And that may or may not happen. So if it is happening, noticing how it's changing.
And we'll just take a few more breaths, again, to be that breath detective, see what else you can notice. Now just opening your eyes again, letting your hands drop down. So I'd like to just hear what, what you noticed. Where was their movement? What did it feel like? More abdominals in the chest. So more movement down here. Yeah, and was there some movement in the chest too? A little bit? Who else had more movement? Let's do the opposite. Who had more movement in the top hand? Yes? And who else had more movement in the bottom hand? Okay, interesting. And what else did you notice? Did anyone notice, like, was the breath smooth? Was it jerky? Were there pauses? It got smoother. It got smoother? Someone else said that too. Were you trying to do that? No, nope, that was just kind of... That just happened? paid attention to it and it became more... And, and it longer breaths. So it became longer, it became smoother. And what did it feel like when that happened? Calm. It felt calming. Hey, what about for other people? Yes? Well, I found that uh, as we went through the exercise, uh, it occurred to me that my stomach movement was more a result of my upper chest movement, which I was not feeling. So it was that one was inflating, deflating, and they were moving the diaphragm. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, because you don't actually breathe into your belly. Yeah. You breathe into your lungs. It's interesting, yeah. You know, and there's no, not, many of you have probably heard there's a, a better way to breathe, right? Have you heard that before? Was anyone trying to change their breath? A little bit? I do on occasion, but I wasn't that time. Yeah. Um, you know, when it comes to mindfulness, there's no right or wrong way to breathe, obviously, right? And what we find is that when we pay attention to breathing, often the attention in and of itself changes the experience like Kelly was talking about. Now, did anyone find the exercise unpleasant or did it feel uncomfortable? Because usually there's one person in every crowd who says, oh, that was really hard or I felt anxious or something like that. I found it overall relaxing. Relaxing and overall? Yeah. Holding down in the mind. Yeah, and whose mind was racing? Don't tell me nobody had a racing mind. When the motorcycle made it, I yeah. a mild irritation. <laughs> you notice it? That's great that you notice that, right? Because it shouldn't be that way, right. <laughs> you know? But it is, so, so, so what, right? Uh, it was very comfortable. Like, it was very comfortable feeling. So it felt comfortable in what way? Like, just pleasant? It was nice. It felt pleasant. Any other observations? Did anyone notice tension or discomfort in the body? Yes? I think when that loud burst of exhaust hit, uh, it sort of jogged my memory back to last night when the thunder hit. Oh. It was kind of dark, and it just rattled the house. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, hey? But so just for a split second, back yeah. and then it was back again. And so you noticed your mind going there, and you brought it back. Yeah, and that's great. That's actually, you know, people often say, oh, I can't meditate because my mind keeps going off different places. And I said, well, what did you do when you noticed that? Oh, I noticed it and came back to my breath. I'm like, well, you're meditating. That's the success in the practice is noticing the wandering and coming back because that's the training is the, not the wandering, the never wandering because your mind's always going to wander. You know, that's just the way minds are. But the noticing it and noticing it quicker and quicker and bringing it back and people in our program, usually after doing that for three or four weeks, the mind just doesn't do that as much. It doesn't wander as much because you're building new. It's like when you cut across a grass field. You know, the more times you go that way, you're building that path. You're beating down the grass and it's becoming a thoroughfare. And so that's where your mind wants to go after a while is staying in the present moment. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Uh, put this in the context of low level pain. seems to me that I would become more conscious of that pain mm -hmm. in this exercise and that I would be frustrated. Yeah, and so that it wouldn't be helpful, right? Because you'd rather distract yourself from the pain. Yeah, and that's a logical 
way to think about it um, and often the way people approach it is that I don't want to think about my pain, I don't want to be with it, I just want it to go away. But the paradox again of it is that paying attention to your pain allows you to do a couple of things. One is to actually become familiar with what the sensation is and how it changes subtly over time, but also to release around it, release the tension, because often we protect areas that are painful by tensing our muscles and that tension actually elevates the pain rather than decreasing it. And the other piece of this too is that we often tell people about this idea or this equation of suffering. So your overall amount of suffering equals your pain multiplied or times resistance to pain. So the resistance to pain, the I don't like this pain, the psychological reaction you have to the pain, the I hate this pain, I want this pain to go away, I can't live with this pain, makes it so, your suffering so much greater than just the actual physical sensation of the pain. So there's been a lot of research on mindfulness and pain and what we find is that the pain sensations itself may not change necessarily, but the way you relate to the pain and the way you load on all those levels of meaning and resistance and create suffering is a lot less. So the studies actually show that people um, with chronic pain conditions of many sorts, including cancer-related pain, actually have better quality of life and less pain-related interference and all those kinds of things. So it may seem paradoxical, but it actually, you know, has the, it, paying attention to the pains actually can be helpful if you do it with the right attitude. And that's important. Yeah. Just a comment on the exercise we just did, going back to the drawing that you had earlier about the person with <laughs> yeah. the dog. If I'm going to do that exercise, which is fairly common for me, I go to where that guy is first. And I, I throw every crazy, I let my mind yeah. go crazy wild. Thoughts fly left, right, and center. Sure. And then it comes down. And I find it then much, much. That's brilliant, you know, because we often say to people, you can't stuff stuff down, you can't repress things that are on your mind, right? So if you have worries and concerns, the mindfulness practice, as you're doing on your own, can often be a safe container to, to process those things. Because we know that it's normal to have a whole full range of emotions, and what's healthy is to let them have their time, have their, is that mine? No, okay. Is to let them come and go on their own accord and when we do that, when we offer them space and in mindfulness practice is a good way to do that because it's contained, it's of your choosing, but if you give your mind free reign for all those emotions and all those thoughts to have space, they'll wear themselves out and then it will become quieter. It's when we try and stuff them down and say, I don't want to go there, I've got to be positive, I've got to think this way, they're just going to come popping up anyway. You know, and they're never going to get fully processed and have that, that sort of uh, petering out effect because the thoughts, they're like bubbles. They just rise up, you know, or clouds across the sky is another nice metaphor. They form, they move, they dissolve, but not if we obstruct them, right? Then they behave unnaturally. So if we just let them have their course, they will actually come and go and they, they won't be as threatening. Yes, so thank you for bringing that up. Yes? How is this process of mindfulness relate to, for example, Qigong? Qigong is, um, has a big element of mindfulness in it. So we often talk about Tai Chi and Qigong. They're practices that come from traditional Chinese medicine or martial arts. And they're like moving forms of meditation, really, um, because the focus is more in the body and it's certain movements or certain breathing, uh, purposeful breathing styles. And they're very similar. They're very highly related. It's really just the form is a little bit different, yeah, but they're very similar. We're actually doing, um, we just started offering a Tai Chi Qigong class at the Tom Baker, and we're comparing it in a study to the mindfulness class. So the mindfulness class is more of a mental sort of um, mindfulness training, whereas the Tai Chi Qigong is more physical training, and we're comparing them. And actually, some of you people may be eligible for that study. Um, it's going on for the next few years where we're comparing those two programs on a whole bunch of different measures and outcomes, yeah. Well, why don't I carry on? Um, I'll sit down so you can see the slides again. Uh, and we'll do, hopefully have a bit more time for questions at the end to do another practice. Um, so I mentioned that mindfulness is an idea that comes from an ancient history in Buddhism and Eastern philosophy, but it has been brought to the West most notably around 1979 by this fellow called John Kabat-Zinn. 
Um, and he developed this program in the late 1970s, and he called it mindfulness-based stress reduction. And this was in um, the University of Massachusetts Medical Center in Worcester. And so what he did was take sort of Western ideas of stress reduction and combine them with mindfulness meditation. He put them together in this eight-week training package that was secular and very accessible. And he started offering it to people at the hospital who were sort of falling through the cracks. So they may have had chronic pain or heart disease or cancer, or anxiety disorders, and they weren't being helped with their conventional medical treatment. So he started offering these classes, he developed them and started um, assessing outcomes, and it turns out they were really very, very helpful for many people. So he wrote this book, Full Catastrophe Living, and I love the title, right? <laughs> um, so the full catastrophe, right? You can't turn off your life. You know, stuff's gonna happen, planes are gonna fly over, there's gonna be motorcycles, it's gonna be hot, there's gonna be all sorts of things that come and go. So can we live through the full catastrophe and still embrace life and be mindful? Um, so this is a wonderful book, I highly recommend it if you're looking for a great introduction, lots of stories about people he worked with, lots of background. And so since that time, there have been hundreds and hundreds of scientific studies looking at this MBSR program for a huge range of physical and psychological psychological disorders, so depression, um, anxiety being the major psychological ones, and for physical disorders, lots of work in cancer, in cardiovascular disease, diabetes, HIV, all sorts of things. So there's a website I list there that summarizes all the research if anyone wants that level of detail. Um, and so I'm going to ask you a question. So I talked about how many research studies have been accumulating, um, and this is in scientific journals, you know, that are in the literature. How many studies do you think came out in 2015? Take a wild guess. 2,000. 2000. That's high, yeah. I'll show you. You guys don't really have much to go by to know. Um, but this shows you the growth, the sort of trajectory of mindfulness studies over the years. So John Kabat-Zinn, if you look, it goes right back to 1980. Um, and there was none. Kabat-Zinn published his first study in 1982, 1983. And for many, many years, there was just a few every year. Our first study came out in the year 2000. You can see in that year, there was 12 studies. So we were ahead of the game. We started doing our program here in 1998. But since then, the interest has just skyrocketed, right? You can see at 674 in 2015. In 2016, I don't think they have the numbers yet, or maybe they do. They haven't updated the graph. It's probably close to 1,000. Um, so there's huge interest in this, and you, you see it on the cover of Time. You know, you'll be hearing about it in lots of places. Uh, so we've contributed to that in the area of cancer. So that's what I'll focus on. Our program, we called it Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery because it's an adaptation of the MBSR standard sort of program. That's just a, a picture of some of the people who've been through our group. Um, but we think it fits really well for going through the cancer experience. And this is my favorite cartoon here. So you got the spider. And he says, I just seem to be spinning out of control. Right? And that's sort of a good illustration of what it feels like to get a cancer diagnosis. So a lot of the things that are ubiquitous or common across all types of cancer is this life threat or the realization of mortality. So no matter how good your prognosis, you know, even if you're likely to be treated and do really well, you have that thought. When you hear you have cancer, you think, oh my God, am I going to die from this? What does this mean? You know, my life might be shortened. Um, how do I want to live my life then, right? If I realize now I might be coming to the end of it, um, what are the sort of fears and concerns that come up for me around that? And I've alluded to this loss of control idea. So, you know, there's so much about the cancer experience that the doctors can't tell you. We don't know exactly. This is the probability. You can do this treatment or that treatment. I can't really tell you what's going to happen for you as an individual. You know, so how do we deal with that when we're used to kind of problems that are more concrete? This is sort of a vague existential things. This loss of certainty, loss of predictability, loss of routine. You, know, you may have to change your plans. You're going to travel. You're going to, you know, retire or do spend time doing certain things. Um, you know, you may have to change that plan. Your routine is out of whack if you're going through treatment. So this certainty and this future orientation we had is challenged. There's all sorts of feelings people experience. There's grief and loss. There's fear about the future. There can be anger. Why me? Why is this happening? What's going on here? And sadness about all you may have lost and not knowing what the future brings. There can be physical symptoms like pain, like we've talked about. Um, 
The most common symptom for people is fatigue, just this lack of energy that can last for months or even years. And sleeplessness and insomnia is a huge common symptom in people with cancer. So you're lying awake at night, it makes you more tired during the day, it makes your pain worse, it makes you feel depressed. And there is after treatment, no matter how good your prognosis, again, often there's this fear of recurrence, right? Okay, I'm fine now, but when's it gonna come back? Right? Every symptom gets you worried, you're running to the doctor, it kind of hangs over you like a dark cloud. Right? Um, so those are some of the common elements of the cancer experience and it turns out that the mindfulness practice is really, really good for addressing all of these things for many different reasons because we are learning how to live with uncertainty, we're learning how to ride the waves and let go of needing to control everything, this idea of non-attachment. It helps us cope with pain and it actually helps people sleep better and I'll show you some of the research there. So it's really ideally suited in many ways for dealing with this specific experience. So our program was developed in 1996 by my colleagues Michael Specka, Maureen Angan and Eileen Goody. Um, they started talking about this amongst themselves. They were people who did yoga, they did meditation. They said why don't we try to offer something like this to the patients? Uh, going through the program. And then I came in 1997 as a student finishing my PhD and I had a personal practice of meditation and yoga and I had learned about John Kabat-Zinn and his work from Montreal where I did my graduate training and I said hey you guys do you know that there's a program out here where that they're already doing this but no one's ever tried to offer it to cancer patients. I said let's do this right so we adapted what they started. Um, we created this program. It's open to anybody who's had a cancer diagnosis and family members. So we encourage people to bring spouses or children or support people. Um, we run it three times a year. So the next program starts in September, mid-September. It's a nine-week program. You can, I'll give you the number, you can call Psychosocial Resources, sign up. We do it in groups of 15 to 20 people uh, each time and it runs again nine weeks. So we've had over 2,500 people through the program over the years and we've documented their experience in many ways. So we have this ongoing clinical program that's free for everybody and we have certain little research studies that we embed in it. Um, and we've written a book too, so if you can't come in person to the program, uh, Michael Speck and I wrote this book, Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery. And I didn't bring it, but it, that's what it looks like. And it's a paperback, it's cheap, 15 bucks or something like that on Amazon. And it covers the whole curriculum that we would teach you in the nine week course. And it's got guided meditations in it. There's a place you can download the, the tracks um, on one of our websites. So you can kind of do a home study if you're interested to do that too. So it's a nine week program, like I said, um, our sessions are an hour and 45 minutes now. There's usually two instructors. And I haven't talked a lot about the mindful yoga, but that's a big component of it as well. Um, and often people say, yoga, I'm not gonna do yoga, right? You know, you're not wrapping your leg around your head or something like that, but it's really more about mindful movement. And I'll show you, we'll do a bit of that. Um, and we do different types of meditations. So one's called the body scan. We do sitting meditation, walking meditation. We give everybody a booklet with a reading list and we encourage people to do a daily practice. And we give you guided meditations where you can spend 30 to 45 minutes every day doing this. Um, and you keep track of how much practice you do when there's a six hour silent retreat between week six and seven near the end of it where we bring everyone together and we practice everything we've learned over the, over the weeks. So the overarching theme of the program is mindfulness. So it's all about different ways to try and develop mindfulness in your daily life. We teach you about how to physically relax your, relax your body using techniques like abdominal breathing. We introduce the gentle yoga. And the idea with the yoga is really to just reconnect with your body. You know, there's this funny quote um, from a, a novel that said, Mr. Quinn lived a short distance from his body. You know, like we're cut off at the head or something. But there is no separation. Every state of mind has a state of body and it reflects back and forth. So the yoga helps us tune in a bit more to what our body's telling us. You know, because sometimes we can have tension and we don't even know it. And it can cause discomfort and pain and contribute to all sorts of problems. We talk about the mind-body connection and the science of the mind-body connection. We teach you some visualization and some imagery techniques. We also talk about cognitive coping strategies. So that's ideas about how we interpret the world and then stories we tell ourselves. And the idea that it's not really what happens out in the world that determines how you feel. There's an in-between piece, which is how you make sense of it, how you interpret it, what conclusion you jump to, what story do you tell yourself about what this means. So we talk a bit about that. 
And it gives you personal empowerment is really just this idea that it's something you can do. Right? You're handing over so much of your treatment to the doctors and the nurses. This is something you can do when you want, how you want, and it's going to help you with your well-being. And we do it in a group, so there's an element of social support, and people really like hearing other people's stories and practicing together. Um, so these are the different themes we do each week. We, we do an introduction to mindfulness, an orientation. We talk about the attitudes. And every week we kind of have a topic, and then we also do some yoga, and then we do some meditation practice. Oh, we talk about the stress response, uh, mind, body, wisdom, and healing. We use breathing exercises to show you how to balance out your nervous system. We spend the sixth week talking about these ideas about coping mindfully. Um, the seventh week, we use imagery to help you cultivate certain beneficial states of mind and body, like kindness and compassion. We talk about how to expand and deepen your meditation uh, program near the end. And then at the very last class, we talk about, OK, how are we going to move this forward and keep it as a daily practice for everyone? So these are illustrations of the types of meditation practices that we do. The one in the upper right-hand corner, everyone's lying there. They're very busy. You can see they're working hard. Um, they're doing a body scan. So this is the first meditation practice that we do. Everyone lies on a yoga mat, and we just actually take your attention, say, from your toes, and you just pay attention to all different parts of your body slowly over a half an hour, just paying attention from your toes all the way up to the top of your head, just lying still. Sitting meditation, this fellow here is sitting in a chair, you know, so you don't have to sit on a cushion and wrap your legs around your head. You can sit however you're comfortable. And that's just breath awareness, almost like what we did at the beginning. That's one of the core practices. We also do walking meditation. So these fellows here, you can see you don't have to look down, but they're slowly walking and they're, the focus of the mindfulness and the awareness is the movement and the body and the sensations of walking. Open awareness meditation is a type of sitting meditation where we're beginning to expand our focus from just the breath onto all the elements of experience, so into sound, into sensations in the body, into thought, into feelings. We do an imagery or visualization where we imagine ourselves like a mountain or like a lake and embody the qualities of those natural objects. And we do something called a loving kindness meditation where we purposefully try to cultivate feelings of kindness and compassion for ourselves, for our loved ones, for other beings. So these are the, the range of different practices that we do. OK, so I was going to go through some research. How's our time? Probably about 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, so before we do that, I want to uh, stand up and wake ourselves up a little bit. So let's do a tiny bit of mo yoga which is really just mindful movement. So if you can stand so that you can do, move your arms without whacking someone. So let's just stand up. We call this standing mountain. So notice your feet, and can you put them about hip width apart? And notice if your toes want to point out, let's point them straight. So our feet are straight. They're about hip width apart. Your knees are a little bit soft and bent. And now see if you can tuck under your pelvis. So see how I've got like that? See if you can imagine you have sand in your pockets and you kind of tuck under your pelvis like that. And imagine there's like a string at the very crown of your head, like pulling you up, up to the ceiling, and your arms are just dangling off your skeleton. So your shoulders go back and down a little bit. That opens you up through the chest. And your fingers would be along the seams of your pants, not forward like that, but kind of back and open. So the knees are soft. And now also sometimes our head goes forward a little bit like that, like a pigeon. So you want to draw your chin in and imagine that your earlobes are over your collarbone. So you're drawing your chin in and down a little bit. Your gaze is forward and down. And we don't want this to be really tight and tense. We want it to be kind of loose and relaxed. So that's our sort of um, home base posture in our standing poses. It's called standing mountain. Let's breathe in and exhale. Just release your shoulders like this. OK, so you're starting to loose. So we're going to coordinate our movements with our breathing, and we'll just do some real simple movement. So just breathe naturally. And let's begin as we breathe in by reaching out and up with both arms. And then gaze up to your fingers, reach to the ceiling, and then exhale, just bring them down. And come back to your home base. Don't do anything else yet, and just check in. What did that feel like? Did it feel good? Where did you feel your muscles moving? 
Let's do it again. Inhale. And this time, if you want, come up on your toes a little bit. Reach tall and down. So notice how that challenges your balance a bit. You can feel your ankles maybe cracking and stretching. Let's do it again. So you can either come up on your toes or not. Inhale up. And exhale, let's come down. Okay, and this time widen your stance a little bit. We're gonna do a little bending to the side. So we'll come up with both arms again. Inhale up. Now exhale, bend to the side. Make a C shape with your body, like you're between two panes of glass. And then when you're ready to inhale, come up again. Reach tall, and then exhale to the other side. When you're ready to inhale, again, come to center. Reach tall, and then come down. Check if your knees are locking up. So just check in with yourself. What did that feel like? Let's do that one more time. So let's try, oh, we're going to raise our arms a different way, just, just to see how it feels different. So we're going to inhale, and this time bring your arms up this way. End up in the same place, and then let's exhale, bend to the side again. Inhale up. Reach to the ceiling first, and then exhale, bend to the side. Inhale up to center. And exhale. Oh, you know what? Let's come down to the side. We're going to stop halfway. Okay, now when we're going to inhale, now we're going to pull our fingers back. And push your hands out like you're pushing apart the walls. And then exhale down. How's that? Let's do a little twist and then we'll finish. So we're going to twist our spine like we're wringing out a sponge. So you can start by putting your hands on your hips. And when we inhale, we're going to lengthen through the spine. And then when we exhale, let's start twisting from the bottom. So the knees, the hips, and then bring your chest and your head very last to look over your shoulder and hold this for a couple of breaths. So inhale, you're lengthening. Exhale, you're twisting. So next time you inhale, you lengthen, and then exhale, untwist, unwind from the top to the bottom. Try that. So head, chest, hips, back to center. Okay, now you might feel a little out of balance. So we always do both sides to have symmetry in the body. So we'll do the other side. So first inhale and lengthen. And then exhale, let's twist the other way, like you're wringing out a sponge. Hold it for a couple of breaths. And exhale, unwind. Okay, back to standing mountain. We'll end with a funny one. Um, I like this one. It's called the lion, and it's a face stretching exercise. So you're all looking at me, so nobody's, nobody can see you. You can just see how silly I look. So what we're going to begin, we're going to hold our hands like this. When we inhale, we're going to squeeze our hands and squeeze our face like this. And then exhale, go. So open your eyes, open your mouth, open your face as much as you can. So let's do it again. Inhale. Exhale. Awesome. Okay, one more time. Oh, very good, very good. You guys are awesome. Okay, let's carry on now. <laughs> Okay, I'll take you through some of the research studies that we've done. Um, some people like to, to sort of see how we know, how I know what I'm talking about. Um, so this slide just summarizes a lot of the studies. We've done over 40 studies over the years, actually. Um, this is all with people coming through our program with uh, some only breast cancer, some breast and prostate, some mixed groups of cancers. But we've looked at symptoms and shown reductions in a wide range of different symptoms related to stress, mood, anger, anxiety. I'm going to show you some of those. And then we've also asked the question, okay, we can help people cope with symptoms, but can we help improve their well-being, right? Not just take away symptoms, but enhance your quality of life. Um, and we've looked at these ideas of spirituality and growth, and I'll talk to you about what we mean by those. 
And also I have a background in something called psychoneuroimmunology, which is the scientific term for the study of the mind-body connection. So we take biological samples from people. We get your saliva, we take blood samples, and then we look to see what's happening with your stress hormones before and after the program. We look right down at the cellular level. We've looked at telomere length, which is like the caps on the ends of chromosomes. Um, we look at inflammation in your immune cells, your cytokines, and we look at blood pressure. And all of those things change when you do this program. So people who have elevated blood pressure, it goes down almost as much as if you take a medication. People who have high stress hormones or abnormal pro, uh, patterns of, horm of stress hormone secretion, it normalizes them, it makes them more, look more healthy. Um, the same, it decreases inflammation um, and it maintains this telomere length which is associated with health outcomes as well. So I'm not gonna go through all those but um, we've done those studies and so have other people too. I'm just going to show you a sample of the very first study we did where we took 89 people who just signed up for the program, they had all different types and stages of cancer on or off treatment, and they either took the mindfulness group and we tested them before and after, or they waited and we tested them twice while they were waiting so they didn't get the program yet. And that was the control group. And we looked at symptoms of stress and mood disturbance. And this shows the people. So this is the stage of cancer they had. So stage one is the gray, you know, that's the earliest stage. We had 20% of the people there. About 40% were stage two, 20% stage three, and 20% stage four. So these are people with all different sorts of um, severities of cancers and all different types too. And I don't think I have the type slide, but it was everything. Now these um, graphs show you what happened before and after on a measure of total mood disturbance. So the blue group is the mindfulness group and the red group is the controls. And before, they both had around the same level, it's around 35, that won't mean anything to you. But the important thing to look at is what happened to the blue group before and after. So there's a huge decrease in mood disturbance. And the last bar shows you the magnitude of the change. So the people who were waiting hardly had any change. They still had high levels of mood disturbance and anxiety. But the people who did the mindfulness group, it went down and the change was like 65% of their score. Like it was really significant. These are the different subscales, and this shows you the change in the mindfulness versus the weightless people. So there was much greater decreases in anxiety, depression, anger, a bigger increase in vigor, and smaller effects on fatigue and mental confusion. And we did the same thing with another scale called the symptoms of stress inventory, and I'll show you the subscales. And it's the same pattern. So before the program, everyone had the same high level of stress, but afterwards, the people who did the mindfulness, it decreased about 35%, whereas it didn't change much for the people who were just waiting. And these are the subscales there. So these show you the big decrease, and the largest changes were in this scale called habitual patterns. And those are kind of like things like biting your nails, smoking, drinking too much alcohol, kind of um, behavioral things that are associated with coping with stress, like unhealthy behaviors. People did less of that. They had less muscle tension, less cardiovascular symptoms like a beating heart. Um, they felt less irritable and less anxious. So in another study, we looked at sleep because we know that 80 Actually, it can be as high as 100% of people going through cancer have difficulties with sleep. How many people here have had sleep problems? A few of you, actually not as many as usual. Um, it's quite common. So we took 63 people and they again, they had a variety of cancer types. And we looked at just before and after the program, we had them re report uh, questionnaires about their sleep. And we saw improvements in stress, mood, and fatigue. And this is the sleep stuff. So these are just before and after the treatment for one group of people. Um, and higher scores are worse, so it's sleep problems. And what you can see is that these are the subscales. So subjective sleep quality, that's how well do you think you're sleeping. That improved significantly for people. Sleep duration, so they're actually sleeping longer. Um, and it was almost an hour longer. And sleep efficiency, that's how much time in bed that you're actually sleeping. So if you have bad sleep efficiency, you're lying there tossing and turning a lot. If you have good sleep efficiency, you go to bed and you sleep. So people were spending less time awake in bed as well. So that's a taste of that. Now I wanna talk a bit about some of the positive outcomes we've looked at. There's this idea of post-traumatic growth, and it's based on the observation that sometime traumatic events, like getting a cancer diagnosis or other things as well, they can have a silver lining, and it's sometimes called benefit finding. So it's this idea of it 
gives you pause to think about your life and reevaluate your place in the world and try to make sense of why me and look at uh, what brings you meaning and purpose. Um, reconsider what's important to you in life. And so people often renew their focus on things that bring them true authentic happiness. So that's what we mean by post-traumatic growth. And there's subscales on a, we have a questionnaire that asks people about that. And the subscales are around relating to others. So um, having a stronger connection with other people, feeling more internal personal strength, seeing new possibilities, um, appreciation of life and spiritual change. And I'll talk about that in a second. So spirituality is a concept that's distinct from religiosity. So it's not about going to church. It's more about feeling a connection with something larger than yourself. And that can be a higher power, or it could be nature, it could be other people. It's a sense of community and connection, and feeling strength and comfort from these connections, whatever they are. And it incorporates a sense of meaning and purpose in life. So it's a bit similar to the benefit-finding thing and, and uh, an overall sense of harmony and peace. So we have subscales tapping into meaning and peace and the role of faith and illness. So we've given people questionnaires around that. We've also uh, done interview studies with people who've been in the program for a long time. I don't know if I have time to go through all this. Mm, I'll skip through a little bit of it. But what we did was we interviewed people who did our program and we have a weekly drop-in group for graduates. So anyone who's been through the nine-week program can then come any week, every Thursday. They can just drop in whenever they want. And so we interviewed some people who had been coming to that program um, between one and six years. In fact, we started that program in 1998. There are some people who still come every week. They've been coming for like 19 years. Um, at this time when we did the study, they'd been doing it between one and six years. So we interviewed them about why do you keep coming? What is it about this practice that you like? Um, and so we identified a number of themes. And the first one was this idea of shifting paradigms. I don't think I'll read all these out to you. But it's the idea of the eight-week group being just a beginning for people. Um, and they were searching for ways to deal with treatment and recovery. And they were able to see things in a new way and new possibilities. And I like this quote, the whole notion of embracing change is the constant. I never really thought of it that way before. So it was an introduction to a new way of thinking about things in the eight-week program. And they use these tools for what we call self-regulation or coping. Coping with stress, internal coping, being an active participant, so this idea of empowerment, um, and having more emotional control. So the last quote says, you know, when things really start getting me down, I'll just stop and do, a med do some meditation. It just takes me over that hump and I can go on. And they talked about the importance of the group and the community for practicing. Um, this idea of belonging and sharing a common experience sharing practice together. So this quote here, it's a very powerful experience sitting in a circle of people who've been affected by cancer. I find in it a very profound understanding because we all share a similar experience. You're constantly reminded of your own humanity and the humanity of others. So that comes out in the group practice. And I talked about the idea of personal growth, um, you know, changing perspective, developing feelings of meaning and gratitude, and knowing oneself better. So the last quote, he says, it's changed my outlook on life, my relationship to other people, and most importantly, my relationship to myself. A person has to go inside and find out who they are, what their motivating factors are, and what's good for them. And this idea of spirituality. Um, I like this quote, it's wise, there's this universality about it. You don't have to come from a certain faith tradition to take some of these things away. So even though we don't focus on spirituality in the program, it's something that tends to come out for people as they do these practices longer. So I wanted to mention to you also that we have done an adaptation of this program to an online version um, and did a study of it. So the way it works, I'll just skip through that, is that um, we try and replicate the group experience as much as possible in the online environment. So people from all over the province, the way we did the study, we had about 65 people all over Alberta, and they would sign in. There was a group of about 10 or 12 people. And at the same time every week, they would come to their group on the computer. They would all sign in, and they could see this fellow here. Steve was the instructor. So they could see him, or they could also see the other participants, and they were talking, and they could see he's got a slide up here. So he could show them some teaching material, or he could make himself big, like here he's doing the meditation. Um, and so everybody on the other end, they've got um, microphones, 
and uh, headsets so that they can talk and they can uh, see. So they do the same group basically on the computer. And so we wanted to see if that would be as effective as doing it in person. Um, and this shows you the satisfaction results of the people who did the program. And so 60% of them said they were positively surprised and it exceeded their expectations and 40% said it met their expectations. And 92% of them said they would recommend this program to other people with cancer. And the 2% who, or the, the two people who had reservations said, you know, you just have to have a space in your house where you can look at the computer and do yoga, right? And this just shows you the questionnaires, but I'll skip that. And then we had a number of quotes also from the people who did the online program. Um, and it was interesting because for a lot of people, they can't do the in-person program because they're too tired from treatment or they can't get there geographically because we had people all over the province. But this person said, you know, it was a huge benefit in terms of my energy. I'm still in treatment. Driving to another location can be taxing. So I could conserve my energy strictly for the course and content. Um, and setting up this time and location at home made it easier on non-course days to keep up with the program and practices. And someone else said it was really helpful during radiation therapy as I calm my fears and emotions. I do it every day during my treatment and just become aware of my surroundings on the treatment table. So a lot of people say they use these techniques when they're getting, you know, they're getting chemotherapy or they're getting blood drawn or they're getting CAT scans. It can help a lot. Uh, this person said, this has enhanced my quality of life and contribute to my ongoing experience of living with cancer versus dying of cancer. And someone else said, I believe the program changed my life and given me tools to live successfully no matter what happens. I'm getting much better at not reacting, not letting my feelings and thoughts overwhelm me. I have great faith that practicing mindfulness will not only see me through, but build my resilience. Um, and I like this one too from the person who was somewhat hesitant at the beginning of the course. I'm not a touchy-feely type of person. I had reservations about yoga and meditation, although I had very little actual experience. I found I really enjoyed the sessions and in many aspects the weekly sessions were a highlight of my week. Um, and that was a fellow, yeah, who did that. Um, did you have a question? Yes, I wanted to ask you, has any of your research, and maybe it's not something that's necessarily that easy to deal with, but has any of your research showed that this program uh, might say, for example, uh, improve the immune system of participants that have gone through? And have you been able to do any research where perhaps you can match it with uh, progression of metastasis and where we see or we would see evidence that the metastasis has been um, slowed down mm -hmm. or that uh, the overall survival has been increased as a result of doing this um, or even that just the cancer volume has decreased because it can be measured in different mm -hmm. ways depending on the cancer the cancer volume has been decreased pre and post the program so um, I'll answer your first question about the immune functioning. We have done measures of immune function and shown changes pre and post that would typically be associated with better health. Um, we have not been able to measure disease progression or uh, we use biomarkers, right? So, you know, the immune function, the stress hormones, we've looked now at the telomere length, but it's really difficult to follow people up long enough to see if it's gonna affect disease progression um, and survival independently. So. We haven't focused on doing that kind of research because it's very expensive and it also takes a long time and um, you know, so we haven't really looked into that. There have been studies of other kind of psychosocial interventions that have looked at survival and shown some benefit, but it's quite, quant quite controversial in the literature about whether or not um, that happens or how it happens if it were to. There is some research in, specifically in prostate cancer that has looked at the combination of a special diet, kind of more like a, a plant-based diet plus meditation on PSA levels. Uh, so Dean Ornish has done some of that work. You may have heard of him. If not, you could look him up. Um, but we don't know what the contribution of the diet versus the mindfulness meditation piece would have been on that. Um, so beyond that, there, and there are other researchers who've looked at other elements of immune system functioning. There's a group down in Miami who does that work, but yeah. I might have one follow-up sure. question. Um, and just your, your opinion is uh, whether or not, and given this program, and I understand, I think there's a, certainly a very much benefit, but would you associate or consider stress to be associated with the 
development of cancer or at least the progression mm -hmm. of cancer? Yeah, so that's a question we often get asked. Um, and, you know, a bit of the background is that nobody knows what causes cancer. Um, so we're, you know, even the cancer biologists are still trying to figure that out, but we do know it's very multifactorial. And so the research that has looked at self-reported stress in people before they've had cancer and then followed them up to see, you know, what increases risk of getting cancer. Um, the results around stress levels are variable. So some studies show people are at higher risk and some studies show they're not. But the one thing that is a better predictor is depression. Um, and when they look at people over time, people who have depression at more than one time point, so uh, consistently high levels of depression, um, are more susceptible or have higher risk. And so that's in terms of etiology of cancer. There, it plays a role. It's obviously not the only thing. You know, there's environmental things, there's, you know, personal health history and comorbidities and genetic risk and all that, right? Um, so it likely does play a piece, probably the depression piece. And how that happens, we don't know exactly, but it's probably through uh, inflammation or through the hy hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. There's all sorts of connections. Once people are diagnosed with cancer, again, the stress survival connection is, not, is a bit tenuous. It's not very strong. But the depression survival connection is stronger. So people who are able to reduce their depression if they're depressed while they have cancer, tend to have better outcomes than the people who maintain, who continue to be depressed. So it's not necessarily associated with participation in a program, but sometimes if the programs help people decrease their depression, then they might have better outcomes. But if people can do other things to control depression as well, it's going to probably benefit them. Yeah, so that's the strongest evidence. Yes? Uh, for most of your uh, outcome dependent uh, measures uh, self-report. It seems like from the research that you mm -hmm. indicated self-report measure. What about <coughs> um, measures like uh, cortisol? Yeah, we've looked at that. Uh, at which would be independent of self-report. <coughs> can can be biased by sure. a lot of different factors. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't have the slides right here. We have measured cortisol in a number of different studies. So the way that we do it is cortisol is a stress hormone that is, it fluctuates throughout the day and a healthy pattern is it peaks right after you wake up and then it decreases throughout the day and it's at its lowest around bedtime. So we measure cortisol four times across the day for three days before and after the program. That's the methodology we use. And then we calculate slopes for people. And so we can look at whether the slopes change before and after the program. And we've compared the mindfulness program to um, a, like standard support group program in one study um, and also to a control group. And what we tend to find is that the slope of the people after the program becomes steeper rather than flat. Flat slopes are associated with poorer disease outcomes and poorer mental health outcomes. And it's mostly driven by a decrease in the bedtime cortisol. And we know that elevated cortisol at bedtime is the worst time to have elevated cortisol because it impacts your sleep and your fatigue and all sorts of things. So what the program seems to do is decrease, improve the slope or the steepness of the change over, over, over time by decreasing your bedtime cortisol. So we've shown that in a number of different studies and other people have as well. Yeah, and you may be interested in the telomere length stuff. I, I maybe should have put those slides in, but I know I wouldn't have a lot of time. Um, the way we did that study, it was in breast cancer survivors, and we took blood samples, and we compared people in the support group to the mindfulness group to a no treatment control group. And we looked again over time pre to post. And so telomere length is a marker of cell aging, and you may have heard about it in the, in the media. It's been kind of... Uh, you know, hot topic lately. And so people uh, of the same age, so telomeres shorten naturally with aging. So as people get older and the cells divide, the telomeres get shorter and shorter with each cell division, that's normal. But people of the same age who report higher levels of chronic stress, so they've done studies, for, for example, with caregivers of um, developmentally disabled kids or caregivers of Alzheimer's patients, and those caregivers will have shorter telomeres than other age-matched people who don't have that level of chronic stress. And shorter telomeres are also a risk factor 
for a risk of cancer and a death from cancer and risk for cardiovascular disease and risk for diabetes. So they are a good, what we call biomarker intermediary for heart health outcomes. And so what we did, no one's ever actually, prior to our research, shown that telomer length could change in such a short time frame. So we measured it before and after the intervention, and what we found was that there wasn't any change in people who did the mindfulness. The telomere length stayed the same, but the people in the control group, their telomeres got shorter, just a little bit, right? So we were the first people to actually demonstrate that that was even possible over such a short period of time in relation to an intervention, a psychological intervention. So it's very, you know, it's interesting, it's provocative, what it actually means in terms of health outcomes, we don't know that. And we don't even know if it would be maintained over time. Yeah. Yeah, and now we're doing a study. So I mentioned the Tai Chi Chi Gong versus the mindfulness. We're doing extra biomarker stuff in that. We're doing gene expression. We're adding on to that. So this actually looks at what's happening at the, the level of the genes. And the genes are associated with certain functions like inflammation or, you know, um, antiviral functions. And so you can look at the gene expression before the mindfulness and after and associate um, turning on and off genes related to certain functions. So we're looking at that as well. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Um, all right, so I will just, I don't think we have time. Yeah, no. Um, so that's my contact information. And if you have any questions at all, um, the best way to get me would be my email address. So you can jot that down if you want. And there's a couple of websites there you could visit for more information. Um, and I'm happy, I guess we've only got five or so minutes left, but to answer some more questions as well. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Linda. That was uh, most interesting, and uh, I'd be interested to know why you're still accepting people then for the, for the program. Yes. So. We are. So yeah. you can either sign up for the clinical program. Anybody can sign up for that. Um, the number to call, it would actually be that same number, 355-3207, to get your name on the wait list. The next program starts in September. If you're interested in the study, it's called the MATCH study. You can also call that number, um, and we would uh, put you on the list to be screened. So there's certain eligibility criteria for the MATCH study. Um, if you don't make the criteria, you can still take either group. Just I've been sharing that information in our Well, oh, that's great. So yes, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's been great. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much.